Welcome back. I'm Connie Sokol, your host, and I am thrilled today to have a fabulous, very well-educated and globally renowned guest, Susan Madsen, here to talk with us about women and leadership. Hi, Susan. Hey, great to be here. We're so grateful. Her schedule is incredibly busy, but we are grateful to have carved out a bit of time to talk about this really powerful topic. So before we dive into it, if you are not aware of how honored we are to have this particular guest, I want to make you aware of that. Susan Madsen is a globally renowned thought leader on women in leadership. And in fact, she has either written or edited six books and she, her research has been featured in the US News and World Report, the New York Times, Washington Post, She's written hundreds of articles. She's received numerous awards for her research, her service, and she has many women's networks that she has created and supports, as well as being on many boards. I mean, I don't know when you sleep, Susan. No. <laughs> it's fun. I'm very passionate about my work, and, um, and so it, it's fun most of the time. <laughs> it's tiring, as you know, as you know, it gets tiring occasionally. That's right. Even things that are exciting and motivating can be exhausting. And I think that pretty much is a symbolic sentence of women, especially women in leadership. And you have done just exhaustive research on women around the world in their situations, their influence on our communities, our families and business. And I would love to go, let's delve a little deeper today about some of those important questions about women in leadership. What is basically right now, what's the status of women in leadership kind of around the globe? I know in one or two sentences, but <laughs> you know, we've tried many things over the years. We've seen bursts. Where are we at right now? Well, I have to say that it really depends on what country you're in and even in the United States, what state you're in. But generally speaking for most of the world, I have one of my books is Women as Global Leaders and Women in Leadership Around the World is another book that I've written. And generally speaking, we have made some progress in different ways um, in terms of women in business and in many countries in terms of women in politics. Um, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of research on women in higher education and women in K through 12. And so you are seeing more women leaders like superintendents or principals or, or presidents of universities. I've done a lot of work in that. However, I always have a big however. However, even though we're seeing progress, we're still significantly lower in terms of, you know, when you look at both men and women in those positions, we're still significantly um, low compared to men in many of those settings. And in some elements, uh, especially in certain states and certain countries with women in politics, we still struggle quite a bit. Um, what what do you see as some of the factors for that being the case? Because when you see studies and tests, you see that women are generally speaking so much farther ahead. Why is it that we're not seeing their influence in these spheres? Oh, that's such a complex question. <laughs> that um, and part of it relates now. Now, when I talk about these issues, I talk about two different things. We have internal barriers and external barriers. And internal barriers, we'll talk about uh, that a little bit more in terms of women's identity and calling a purpose and some other things that we're gonna talk about today. Um, and, and when you get into the neuroscience and the research around confidence and how boys and girls and men and women are different in confidence, mainly some genetics, but mainly because of socialization. So those things are important. And it comes back to the book, Lean In, you know, like, like women do need to lean in. And so we do work on women's leadership development and confidence and those kinds of things. So that's one element. But even bigger and more unruly is these external barriers that women face. And those are really housed in socialization, in social norms. In, and, and I do a lot of work and teaching on unconscious bias. It's amazing when you get into really understanding the brain and why and how unconscious bias and the norms, social norms that are there um, and how we're judged and the micro, you know, microaggressions and different things. So even when we work with women on how to negotiate, so women can learn to negotiate better. And by the way, 
women have great talents in negotiation when you look at women and their children exactly. and what women do we do we have potential to negotiate well we've just been socialized in different ways but even when you take that when women do negotiate for a salary for if i'm the boss or you know men too but women too a woman starts negotiated uh, negotiating and we're like, why is she doing that? She's not supposed to, there's these unconscious things that happen. And so women, even when they do, they, they have some disadvantages. So there's a lot of stuff with that issue I just gave you right there. There are like four podcasts in that alone. And I remember <laughs> reading about a gal, she does a show back in New York with two male hosts and she watched how they negotiated. And she said, he went in, his name is Joe. He went in and he just ripped that man a new one and said, this is ridiculous. This is not so she said, I went in, I tried to do that. And it was just not gonna fly. So what she did is she came back later, very calm, very clear, very factual. These are the reasons why you need to keep me on. Otherwise I'm walking. And that works so much better. But it's interesting, men can do some kind of behavior, but that is not expected from women. So therefore it goes against them is what it sounds like. Yes, and there's definitely, there's research on gender and negotiation. There's research out there on most of the elements and there's hundreds of elements that we really talk about and work with, with in terms of helping more women become leaders with that internal, you know, those internal barriers and the external barriers together. You can't do one without the other. You really can't. You can build women and say, you can do it, you know, motivate them, help them understand the research around that. But if we don't work on these unconscious biases, the systems and policies and companies, the, um, the you know, kind of unspoken, norms in nonprofits, in church groups, and those kinds of things, if those aren't addressed and really everyone is educated, then we struggle with that. We're making some progress, but there's still plenty of progress to be made. I love that point that you make that with these two pieces, having to address both. And I think it's especially important for women to first understand those two pieces. And then we can be proactive about making those shifts. I know Wendy Ulrich in her book, Live Up to Your Privileges, she talked about when you're in a setting with men, she gave some different tips of how to be able to kind of hold your ground, but still retain a femininity. So I would love some tips from you. What are some ways that women can walk this line of what I call feminine leadership, where we don't have to wear a pinstripe suit, we don't have to go in like a Mack truck, but we can have a feminine influence and still make our voice heard but we can do it in a way that is um, pleasant, but firm and clear and credible. What are some tips that you might give women to be able to do that? So the more communication that we have, the more awareness of the confidence issues and the different kinds of things. Like women are socialized to say, um, to use disclaimers. Like I just have one thing to say, or I don't wanna bug you, I'm sorry to do this, you know, those are some things that are very much in every country we're socialized. We as young girls see our mothers, see our teachers, see people do that. And we, we um, kind of change our behavior and develop our behavior. Um, and what that does is really makes us not as confident, but it really makes us sound not confident to other people. So there's so many things like that that uh, we need to become aware of and really educate ourselves and educate those other people in the workplace as well. Um, one of the things that's interesting in my research through the years in some of my first books uh, over a decade ago that were published um, is that women who, who are, <clears throat> like one of my books is I interviewed 10 of the women governors and another one I interviewed 10 real prominent university presidents. And it's interesting because the style of leadership they used was right smack in the middle between the most feminine and the masculine. And so the women that we're seeing that are most successful and really pushing things forward really have a nice combination. They're not just on the side being sweet or kind or do those things that a lot of people expect us to do. By the way, I was raised with six brothers, so I do a little bit more masculine than the feminine. And so, 
and it's natural for me. So if women try to act like men and it's not a natural, that's not a good move. Mm -hmm. It used to be that we did that more, you know, some women did that uh, more and more. And if I naturally, I'm an athlete, if I naturally try to do too much feminine, it's not natural for me too. So looking at, at your style, but understanding that that we as women can be firm and we can be assertive and those kinds of things. And again, for anybody that's been a mom, we're, we do use those skills all the time to defend our children, to try and, and get through those doors, to get them, you know, I watched wonderful women in my neighborhood who, one woman next door neighbor who had two autistic sons, and man, did she know how to negotiate and go after services to help her boys. It was amazing to do that. I think you're absolutely right because I think women don't necessarily equate the skills they're learning as being a mother in the home. And there are so many studies now that are showing that correlation that if they've done all of these skills at home, they are actually more attuned to being successful in the workplace. So and I was one of the first, my study one of, was one of the first that was out there. There's been more sense. Uh, but I speak and, and have written about motherhood and how that prepares you uh, for leadership. But I still have to bring up the topic of identity because what it's such a critical topic. I've been thinking about this a lot and reading a lot on deeper identity formation theory and so forth. What we know from the research is boys are socialized much more often to see themselves as future leaders than girls. That's part of, you know, one of the things that we know still today, one of the latest studies say, if we have kids or teenagers or college students, we just say draw a picture of a leader, 70 to 75% will draw a man, and they will draw a tall man, <laughs> and if you can tell color, a white tall man. And that's what is on people's minds. That is what, so women, girls just do not see as many women leaders out there. Some of them don't see any, any women in, in leadership roles. So they do not, from the start, see their potential, see that they need, they should be a leader, that they can be a leader. And so, as they, that's, that's a problem because then they don't, and I meet grown women all the time that I work with and speak with who tell me I'm not a leader, I'd like to be a leader, or some say, no, that's not my role to be a leader. And I say, that's just crap. <laughs> it is a role. It is your role, whether, whatever religion you are, whatever situation, you know, I come from a very spiritual religious background. And I absolutely believe in my um, religious faith that God needs women to be leaders and we need to prepare ourselves to be leaders. And that might look different than a man, but we need to see. So if we do not see ourselves as a leader, the research is clear. So the research is clear that if we don't see ourselves as a leader, we're not gonna become a leader. It's just like if we don't see ourselves going to college, we're not gonna go to college. If we don't see ourselves graduating from college, we're not gonna graduate. So the same thing is true for leaders. So we, um, and, and, I, and I will say there's this model that is, it's got two concepts. So one is claiming and one is granting. And so when you look at leadership identity, if you, women have to claim, like I am a leader. So if we don't see ourselves as leaders, we're not gonna claim. But if it's just about us claiming leadership and we don't really have followers, that doesn't work either. And so even if it's just you and me, if I claim leader and I speak, if you follow, if you listen, if you engage, then you're granting. So those two things are so important for us. I, I just did a TED talk recently uh, on how to raise girls to become leaders. And I talked about this, that help them claim this leadership, help them prepare, help them use their voice, help them be confident. But then you as a parent or as an educator or as a church leader can listen and 
use their ideas and follow. And that's the granting piece. I think it's so fascinating. Those two pieces are beautiful and so interwoven. And I love this clarity for the women that are listening to be able to start understanding, am I claiming that? And am I granting that to other women and not judging that? Because sometimes I've seen that some of the harshest critics of women are other women in them oh, wanting to there's support so much me. research on yes. that topic yes. yes so much research on so, that topic and one of the other things that we were going to talk about that I'll, I'll work in here is that there's a lot of academic research on what we call both purpose and calling and i speak a lot about calling because the research on men and women is different in the term calling and purpose both calling and purpose and calling can actually be religious or not religious. I mean, calling or spiritual and not spiritual. For me, calling for me, because I'm a spiritual and religious, comes from God. So I feel absolutely called from God to do the work I do, to, to help women, to build women, to research, to get the word out there. Yet other research talks about people that are not religious, not spiritual, and they can still feel called too. It's just like they're made to do certain things. The interesting thing with gender, however, is it's been very well documented. It's, it's not, there's not a lot of studies, but I know all the people doing this kind of work in the world, um, that women more than men, if they feel called, if they feel that deep purpose, will step forward to lead, even if they don't feel like they wanted to, you know, throughout their life, they didn't dream. And I've seen this a lot in the political realm, because for most people, I would say, especially women, they're not dying to run for office. <laughs> they're not like, oh, this is going to be fun. You know, They will step forward when they feel called that it's there, that they were made and they're on this earth to do this, to help represent the voices of those silent people that can't speak. You see that so often, a Rosa Parks and Eleanor Roosevelt, they've taken what they've been given or they're in a situation that they have to stand up for someone that is underprivileged or the, a, a, an injustice and they will step forward and fulfill that role. And I think you're absolutely right. When they feel they have almost permission to do it, I think women are more attuned to that feeling and need for permission. And I think what you're talking about is they feel that permission, they feel that they're given the authority to go forward and move forward. And women do that more than men. Yes. Oftentimes we, we are just, we've been socialized in elementary school to wait our turn, to raise our hands. You know, the research says boys are criticized eight times more than girls in elementary school. So when boys get older and they're in the workplace, they throw out ideas there. And if people shut them down, ah, it's not a big deal. But girls are really socialized to be quiet and wait for our turn. And you can't, we can't do that movement forward. Hey, I have a, a wonderful quote I want to read. And it, I don't know if you've read Parker Palmer's work. He's got a book called uh, Let Your Life Speak. It's so fascinating. He comes out of the Quaker uh, faith. But this quote is, our deepest calling is to grow into our own authentic selfhood, whether or not it conforms to some image of who we ought to be. As we do so, we will not only find the joy that every human being seeks, we will also find our path of authentic service in the world, service in the world. True vocation joins self and service, as Frederick Buechner asserts when he defines vocation as, I love this, the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. And I think that that place for women is so critical, where we feel called, where we want to use our gifts and passions, where we see a need, and where we, whether we encourage each other or, or we just go for it, and um, where we really connect that joy, that passion with the world's deep need, whether that's in our homes or in our neighborhoods or schools or globally, whatever that means. 
I think that is the most fantastic point because as women do that, I call it stepping into their purpose. As they step into that purpose, that fulfillment, that joy, that thing that they're looking for comes in droves. It comes in waves because they are involved in the very thing they're wired to do. So if someone is listening out there right now, they're thinking, I want to do this. I want to feel that. I want to know my calling. I want to be able to claim it. What would be a good step for them to do to make that happen? I think, again, education, but there's some great books like Let Your Life Speak is a great one by Parker, Parker Palmer. Um, just get a few ahas, but you know, if you consciously start paying attention, number one, to your gifts. I use Strengths Finder a lot. There's a leadership Strengths Finder. There's other ways. Um, I have found through the years that women have, and I get a little teary-eyed, women generally, and especially in my own state of Utah, have no clue how amazing they are. They have no clue. And they've been socialized into believing that they need to be humble, but humility is viewed at um, inappropriately. Humility just means being teachable. And we can know our gifts and strengths and still be teachable at the same time. And in fact, the research says that when we do know our strengths, we can actually be more of a gift to the world when we understand. So that's the first thing is really explore in detail your strengths, take some assessments like the Strengths Finder, look deeply at those things so we know our gifts, and then pay attention to what makes our heart leap. So what what excites us to get, to, what does our mind go to first thing in the morning? Like what, and we're like getting excited to get out of bed. Um, what class in college, if you're a young woman, you know, to, just gets you excited? Those are the things that we're called to go towards, to be the expert. A lot of times people think, well, I don't wanna to go to college or I don't wanna do this education unless I know what it looks like at the end. And that, you, we don't know that. We don't know what, what our life can be and what we're gonna be called to do or what opportunities are gonna come in our way. We don't know that, but we just prepare to be of good use to God, or if you're not religious in you know, the world or the universe, right? Um, and so being open and paying attention to our gifts and then our strengths and passions um, are really, and then to go and really explore possibilities. The mistake many women do is to look at what they already have in their mind as possibilities. And the problem is that we're limited in what our experiences are. And if we can have courage, if we can be brave and step forward and say, hey, maybe I'm gonna get a master's degree and I'm 55 or whatever, you know, just go out there. Uh, women hate to fail. The research is very clear on that. And we consider many things failure that really aren't failure. So uh, one time I, I had a woman come and said she applied for one master's program and they turned her down. And I'm like, what about the others you applied? And she's like, no, it's, I'm not good enough. So my pep talk was telling her all the things I failed at. So, <laughs> and then she put in for a couple other programs. She got accepted for the next two. Um, isn't that interesting? I love that. And you are so right that as women shift this this lens, this just even by a few degrees of in conversation that, oh, we'll try again. Oh, well, did you try another one? Yeah. Being able to shift the conversation so that it creates a new norm, that will really help us change that overall lens for ourselves and our girls. I love the points that you make that it is us as women, that we are the ones that have to take that first step. We have to see ourselves as the leader and then be our bold self and take the step, whatever that is, to get education or apply for something or to create a resume or even to be a leader in our home, that we have to start taking those first steps. And we have to take steps all the time. And we are not supposed to sit back and wait. And I, I call it, um, oftentimes, I work with a lot of um, young adults 
And oftentimes I, I come with, or I talk to women who are just kind of what I call in waiting <laughs> for the man to come, for, I don't know, the opportunities to come. And I talk to them about how we need to always be stepping forward. And if we're waiting on one thing, that doesn't mean we can't shift and move forward on another. There's a quote that, and I don't remember the quote exactly, but there's a visual that I use often, and, and I think about it for myself. So it's this visual of this big door, this big wooden door, and uh, this image of someone just pounding really close to the door, like pounding, 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 waiting for somebody else to open the door, and then you scoop, scoop out a little bit, scope out a little bit, and you see that the door is in this middle of, middle of this wonderful, beautiful meadow. And if you actually stop knocking on the door and turn around, the entire trees and meadow, everything is there. It's just in a different direction. And sometimes we're so close to and I hear this a lot from young mothers who, who really don't see and, they see either or. So they're like, I'm supposed to be in my home full time, just doing kids. They go through some depression, they're struggling with this or that. And they say, I can't do anything else. And that's often I say, that's just crap. <laughs> I use that word a lot. And it's, it's like you step back and you don't look at the rules that you think have been set for you. You turn around and say, what are the possibilities? Yes, I can be a good mom. I can take care of this and that. And I can also serve on the city council or volunteer, you know, or sit on a committee in the city. Um, those things can just unleash this potential of women and unleash sometimes Sometimes as women, we hold back our hearts. We hold back our passions and say, in another season, I'm not a fan of the times and seasons kinds of thing. I'm like, in another thing, right now it's all about this. And sometimes it's not. You can do a little of this, a little of this, a bunch of this, and combine it to then feel this peace, this peace that is absolutely critical for women to seek and obtain, that right now in our lives, we're doing what we're supposed to do. I love um, it. And it's joy, that's when you have joy. Yeah. And that's when you have true impact, whether the impact is on other kids in your neighborhood, or whether it's your peers, if you're a state legislator, legislator as a woman, um, but we are made to impact positively other people around us. Absolutely. And I love how you addressed the ability to cherry pick that we can do a little bit here, a little bit there, and then another season. Yes, we can go more, you know, pedal to the metal. But in this season, we keep, we keep the, the feeling and the joy and the piecemeal of it. We don't just drop it in extremity. And I love that. And I love earlier when you were talking about um, just being able to do something that's maybe that bold step to move forward in the thing that you want to do. I know Cheryl Sandberg talks about sitting at the table and how women just sit around the perimeter of the table, even when they're invited. And I just had a recent experience with that at a, a meeting and I, they, I was running late. It was huge filled room. I, I saw a clear table at the top. So I just scooted up there. I went, oh my gosh, I think it's a VIP table, but there was no sign. I thought, no harm, no foul. So I sat down, I ended up, it was the attorney general and it was the speaker, the keynote speaker that sat down next to me and we had a great conversation. So I love that concept of just sit at the table. Just don't wait for someone to invite you. Step up and say, can I take this seat? Can I take this seat? And I think as we do that in every stage of our lives, like you're suggesting, whether you're a young mom, you're a mother of teenager, you're an empty nester, we're going to develop that um, gift packet, those gift packets within us in a way that works within that season of our life that we're in. Yeah, and sometimes we're just really socialized or we see certain cultural behaviors that women need to wait or women need to do this or women need to do that. But you know what? It's a new generation and there are things these days 
that we must have more women stepping forward to accomplish. There are complex problems. There are, I mean, when you, when you look just in my own state of Utah, let alone the United States, let alone all these other countries, there's so much that all of us need to do. And anyone listening to this podcast, you know, we're all entitled in some way. We are. I mean, I'm entitled because I, I have an education, you know, for many reasons. I'm entitled, I've decided, because I have six brothers. And, and I learned how to work with men so easily and naturally, you know. We are. And with that entitlement, with those gifts, with that privilege, we are expected to do more with our voices. And um, even though we're socialized, maybe, maybe we don't belong in these settings. I will tell you, it's a new, it's a new day, right? It's a new day. And we need women to step forward. And we need good men to be allies and to get it. We have whole research reports on male allies and what really great men can do to better advance women and support women. And that's an important element to talk about as well. Oh, that is fantastic because when men and women work together in respect, it is a phenomenal outcome. Yeah. When the focus is on what is the best way to be successful with this project or experience rather than ego or credibility, who gets the credit, that kind of a thing. I think this is so phenomenal. And I swear we could go on for probably yes. six more podcasts. We're going to have to have you back for another one because I know confidence is a huge factor in yeah. this and this being able to understand identity even more fully. And then of course, working with men in a positive way, but encapsulating some of the things, I wanna hit some of the high points that you shared that I think were phenomenal. First, we have to see ourselves as leaders, as women, and then discover our strengths, have some fun with this, have, have some, take some time to discover some of these strengths. And then next you say, which I love, pay attention to what makes your heart leap. Isn't that fabulous women? Pay attention to what makes your heart leap and then explore the possibilities. I love that. What are the possibilities? We don't just have to stick with one or the other. There's a variety of solutions to be able to achieve that ultimate heart thumping end that we're looking for. So beautiful, beautiful things to share, Susan. If people want more from you, which I know they're going to that are listening, what is the best way to reach you and where can they find you besides your beautiful books on Amazon? Where can they find you? Well, if you're in Utah, or actually I have many people that sign up for my listserv that are not even in Utah, utwomen.org is, we have so much research and lots of resources, and I have a global tab that has all kinds of things. You can find me on LinkedIn as well, Susan um, R. If you put that R in there on Amazon or any place, you'll get uh, my LinkedIn, Susan R. Madsen as well, and I, I do wanna mention just very quickly one more thing I talk about often, and that is the tap on the shoulders. Uh, about 30 to 40% women need the tap more than men. And what I mean by that is uh, because of socialization and so forth, I mean, men will, you know, you've probably heard the research um, on if men are 50 to 60% qualified for, for a promotion or to run for office, they'll just throw their hat in the ring, I'm good enough. And women, it's typically a few studies have said 90 to 100%. Um, but if we tap, and women can be powerful with other women, and men, of course, and that is, you know, we just, I call it the tap, like, hey, you know, have you considered running for a city council? You know what's going on in the community. You articulate yourself well, and I believe you can make a difference. The research, I, I tapped about 10 women this year to run for office, and, uh, and 10 ran for office, and I think six were elected, but they, most of them told me it took three taps. So I tapped a mute first, then someone else tapped him. The third, they start thinking, oh my gosh, I do need to do this. People are wanting, you know, this relational element is so strong with women. So what can we do? We can tap ourselves, I suppose, but I will say whatever we do for ourselves, let's, let's reach out and do those things. You know, tap young women, tap sons, daughters, tap other women. It's amazing how powerful 
when I say, and I just had a conversation yesterday where I told someone, I said, you do know you're going to have to run for the state legislature soon. And we'd never talked about this. And she's like, huh. She's like, I've actually kind of been playing with that in my mind. But I actually talked to her out loud about it. And I said, you can do it. You, you need it. You've been prepared to do this. And that little tap that I did yesterday will make a difference. That will make a difference. Yeah, be careful when you're around, Susan, because you don't know what you're <laughs> going to be accomplishing starting tomorrow. I think that is phenomenal. And what a gift we can give to each other as women to support and become those beautiful allies for each other and tap each other on the shoulder. Susan, this is phenomenal. This has been fantastic information today. Ladies, I hope you will take it and run with it. I'm going to give you a tap. We have our free Step Into Your Purpose download. It's a free four-week course that you can go in and define your purpose, increase your capacity, become and choose the talents and abilities, discover what they are, and then take the next right step. And we help you do every bit of it. I love it because I didn't know exactly where what the direction we were going to go in. And it just dovetails beautifully with the information that Susan just gave. This is a how-to to step right into it. You can get that at ConnieSokol.com and check it out there. We would love to help you step into your purpose. Susan, thank you again for joining us today. Can't wait to have you back. Thank you. And remember, subscribe and review below. And we'd love to help you with any needs that you have at ConnieSokol.com to make this your year to get balance redefined.